You're listening to The Joyous Podcast with Mike Carden, where we talk to the world's most interesting business thinkers about life and work, and work and life. For show notes and other content referenced in this podcast, visit joyoushq.com slash podcast. And now, here's Mike. Hello. Welcome to the Joyous Work Podcast, where we talk work and making work great. Um, I'm Mike Carden, co-founder of Joyous, and my guest today is, drumroll please, the Vince Labardi of uh, customer loyalty, Rob Markey. Rob, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Mike. I, uh, I'm a little embarrassed by being called the Vince Lombardi <laughs> of customer experience, <laughs> I, I, and I'm, I'm a little surprised that a, a New Zealander uh, knows who Li Vince Lombardi is. <laughs> oh well, but yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a closet Packers fan. I spent a lot of my life in California, but I ended up like I'm not a 49ers person, so so the there you go. But I think I think Vince Lombardi is uh, well. Actually, for listeners that don't know, he is I guess the greatest NFL coach of of all time. Probably well, early 60s Packers coach took them to maybe five. Oh, actually, it's pre Super Bowl, so five championships. I think I, that's. I, I'm not. A, I'm not an expert. So here's the scary thing. I don't even really know the details. Like, just people started calling me that, and I don't really know enough about. Like, like I don't even know some some famous people. There's like stuff about them that you might not want to be associated with. I don't think there's anything about him, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, hey, so for for the audience that doesn't know, um, Rob is of course the um, the co-author of the New York Times you know, bestseller, the the ultimate question. 2.0, um, and that's the the book that introduced the world, um, you know, to Rob and and Fred Reichold's revolution spawning idea of NPS, the Net Promoter System. So I think Rob spent much of his 33 year career as a as a Bain partner, championing customer loyalty as the big driver of outperformance in in companies, and that that work has included leading many of the world's most dramatic customer experience transformation. So hopefully that's a a slightly uh, more in-depth version of the introduction, Rob. <laughs> well, there's almost no introduction you could do that would uh, that I could live up to. So I'm I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've, I've got to ask you. Last time, last time you and I caught up was was in uh, a very nice um, Italian restaurant in in uh, in San Francisco. Um, you're, you're back in the Northeast now. Um, so, how are you handling this this winter weather? Or or did California make you soft? Well, it, it, um, first of all, I love winter because I love skiing, and and so and I live for skiing. So I'm just back from a weekend with my son skiing out west. We had new snow. That's great. Oh, nice. But I did get soft living in San Francisco. It's um, it just doesn't freeze there, and it was 12 degrees the other day here, and wow, my uh, windshield wiper on my car cracked off <laughs> so, <laughs> I, that didn't happen in san francisco <laughs> mm, mm. hey um, um i um love to to uh do this thing where i ask people what their origin story is you know like 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 a marvel movie so what's the What's the Rob Markey origin story? How did you you kind of land where you are today? Right after I got injected with um, uh, radioactive material, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so I grew up. I grew up the grand the grandson of a um, what's called a meat purveyor, a, a, a guy who my grandfather was selling meat to restaurants and hotels and you know stuff like that, and I got to work with him as my very first paid job um, and observe him and how he dealt with the, the restaurant owners. And he really had a, a service ethos, but he also had a business to run. And so there was this trade-off that he was always making about, for example, um, to whom do I extend credit and which customers get cuts of meat that are in short supply when push comes to shove. And he would talk to me about it and, and explain to me why, how he made those decisions. And then you roll the clock forward a few years and I'm, um, after graduating from college, working in my first job, and I was in a company where um, customer loyalty was a pretty important thing. It was, we were serving, uh, serving up, this is in the 80s, right? So pre-internet, we were serving up um, 
uh, digital versions of legal decisions from the courts to lawyers real time. And it turned out that um, whichever, th- and there were a couple of systems that were available, only two. We were the first one. We had like 80 or 90% market share. But what happened is that um, young lawyers in law school would learn one system or the other, and then they'd kind of become loyal to it because it was what they were used to. And I watched as we went from 80 or 90% share down to 70 and 60 and, you know, closer and closer to parity over a few years. As a result of some miscalculations by leadership, it, some of which were very understandable, but what was fascinating to me was they got huge bonuses while they were losing market right. share, not because anybody, well, because nobody was looking at market share, they were looking at revenue growth and revenue growth was still double digit. And we were owned by a paper company that was growing single digits. Mm. So then you go a couple more years and I'm in business school and this guy, Fred Reichheld comes out with an article while I'm in school that I, we were reading in our service management class and it was called Zero Defection. Quality comes to services. And this is back in the late 80s when total quality management was a really big deal. And the Japanese had dominated world manufacturing by going to zero defects, right? And and managing Mm. quality. And so I was reading this and I was like fascinated by it. And the key thing in that article was customer retention rates matter and they matter to your financial performance. And it was the it was the precursor to what to Fred's later book. It was probably 1996, The Loyalty Effect. But I read that article yeah, and I said, "That's it. This guy gets it. I want to work with that guy." And so, a few months later, I was working at a bank, you know, for Bain and Company, um, with Fred, and we were figuring out why they were wow. losing customers and what was going on and what we could do about it and how much it would be worth to fix that. And really, I spent the next 30 something years working on similar types of issues where you're making trade offs between short term financial performance and long term growth and profitability. And they're not apparent to most people because the metrics and accounting and management reporting masks all of that stuff on a day to day basis. And that's why my boss is back. In you know my first job out of out of college, we're able to get huge bonuses while losing market share. Mm. So so tell me then the the idea of you know so you're doing this work. I mean it's fascinating, by the way. I mean I just, just, just I love doing this, right? So you're doing this work, and um, yeah. So where does this idea of you know net promoter score NPS where does that where does that come? So from? it had its origins actually in the the whole reason that Fred wrote the zero defections article which was, it was very clear that leadership of most companies was focusing on top line revenue growth. And they were pouring money into a bucket that had a lot of holes in it. And Fred said, Mm. we need to give them a metric that helps them understand that they must fill the holes in the bucket. And it has to somehow stand up to the accounting numbers that they rely on every day. And so that's where, you know, customer retention and making the case for Uh, customer lifetime value and how to think about that was all really important in the early days. We quickly discovered that customer retention, while a really good and reliable metric, was very, very late in the game. By the time you lose a customer, the customer has probably made the decision to defect many months before, and it doesn't really show up. You know, and so it's like, I'm always shooting at, at, at the in in um, what's the hockey player who always said I'm gonna I, I skate to where the puck is, Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky, right? Wayne we were Gretzky. doing the opposite of that. We were always our, our clients were always skating to where the puck had been, <laughs> right? And so we were like, we need to we need a better metric that's a little more forward looking. So instead of waiting until customers give us the signal of failing to renew or of out and out quitting. Why don't we get them to tell us what they're thinking and project forward? So what's your intent to renew? What's your intent to buy more? What's your, and we started to realize with, the, with this market research approach, 
the more questions we asked, the more precise we could get, the better predictive ability we had. And we could even go, instead of just predicting attrition, we could predict things like growth in share of wallet and share gain against competitors. And that led us down the path of saying, well, if we need, we need metrics that we can give leaders so that they can strike better balance between their short-term revenue and, and cost goals and their long-term growth goals, why don't we come up with what we, we call the, the acid test? A single number based on asking customers a bunch of questions. We got really good at that. That was probably mid nineties. And we could predict with very, very high precision what would happen in a com company's customer base. The problem was that we kept doing these projects over and over again with many, many companies. We got really good at them. And then oddly, people at the company we had worked with two or three or four years ago, a new group of people would be in the same roles that we had worked for several years ago. And as if nothing had ever been done, they'd come to us and say, we need you to help us figure out how to earn more loyalty of our customers. And we're like, we did that project. <laughs> what happened? Isn't, isn't that a, um, isn't that a, like a management consultant's dream scenario well, it, though? You I, just keep doing the same work, keep charging for it. <laughs> um, an unscrupulous one. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I don't want to, say anything about my competitors in this industry, but that didn't, that wasn't good for us. Like we at Bain don't work that mm. way. We're about business results. And we really deeply believe in the loyalty approach to our own business, which is if we create more value for our clients and for their shareholders, they are going to come back to us for more and they're going to recommend us to their colleagues and friends. And that's how we grow. Interesting. And, and so this is, it's a very, a very drinking your own champagne model in this context. Yeah, but it's also not like, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that in consulting, your reputation is everything, right? I could, I could mm -hmm. pump up my revenue for a few months or years by doing the same project over and over again for the same company and not in, g d delivering to them any enduring capabilities. But that shouldn't make me proud of my work. And it certainly eventually catches up to you. Mm. Anyway, we, with, this, with this observation that this was happening, we were like, we need something that works better. And at, the at that time, Fred was doing these kind of roundtables with um, CEOs from a few companies that he admired, one of which was Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And it was this guy, Andy Taylor. And, and Andy, right. you know, Fred was sharing this idea of the loyalty acid test and he was talking about what he was doing. And, and Andy kind of was like, I don't know, that's really complicated. We have something like that. And it's just one question and we get a lot of action on it. And so Fred wanted to learn more about it. And it became clear that in, in seeking better precision and better predictive capability with a more sophisticated metric, we had missed something really important, which was the ability to capture the hearts and minds of thousands of employees in a big organization. And what Enterprise had done with, they called it the Enterprise Service Quality Index. It was just one question, you know, like about the, the, the quality of your rental experience. What, what they right. had done by going to a less precise single metric was put themselves in a position to engage thousands and thousands of employees throughout an organization and get them all aligned around this one idea. Hey, I got to learn how to do a better job of serving my customers. And mm. I got to figure out how do I, how do I earn, earn, this is really important, earn, not beg, not, you know, cheat, um, more repeat business and more customer recommendations. And so, so after that, after seeing that and, and recognizing like, oh my God, it's radical simplicity. That's what we should be after. We went on this hunt for, well, what is the one question you could ask in lots and lots of industries that would almost always be the most predictive of customers' future behavior, their repeat purchase or renewal, their 
frequency of purchase, their average order value, price realization, cost to serve, and, and ultimately whether they bring you more new customers that they recruit. And it mm-hmm. turns out like the, the questions that we, we tried, and there were a bunch of them, there were like 12 or 15 that we tried. The one that emerged was likelihood to recommend. That was the one that, that most of the time was the most predictive. And when it wasn't the most predictive, it was like number two by a small margin. Wow. What I, what I love about this, this is um, I'm a big fan of the, um, of the expression, uh, let, me get this, let me get this right, that constraints are the midwife of good design. And I, I love the way that the provocation in this is the idea of, of going to a single question. So there's this, uh, this period of kind of research and understanding and then the bit which actually allows you to make what I'll describe as a leap is the bit of going, okay, let's put a ton of constraints ton of constraints on what we're trying to do and in this case those constraints are okay we're only going to be able to answer ask one question and i I think it's a that's that's an interesting idea just in itself isn't it if you're thinking about running a business and you know um, you know i know you want to you want to ask something of employees to understand where you're at with employees you go okay what is the single question i should ask of employees well and and actually uh, mike i want to i want to um head off a potential misunderstanding because I've been (laughs) talking about this for long enough to know that I I could create misunderstanding by saying something. The score is based on a single question. You're not actually limited to just one question. In fact, these days, there are always at least three, not more than five, but always three. How likely are you to recommend? Why? What could we do better? Mm. And I want to put emphasis on those second two because they're, they're open-ended and they're as simple as that. Three letters, W-H-Y with a question mark. Not why did you give us that score? What's the most important reason you gave us that score? Because back to your point about constraints, constraints are great when you're innovating. They're not great when you impose constraints on a customer in terms of what they're allowed to tell you. A, they don't listen, mm. and B, if they do, it skews what you learn. So <laughs> we, we ask why on their likelihood to recommend so that we can understand what was driving them. And then we ask everybody, what could we do better? Because the vast majority of most companies' customers are promoters. They happen to usually have good ideas for improvement, but if you don't ask them for those, they tend not to tell you. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, we're in a fascinating era too, right? Because we've finally arrived at this point because of you know, advances in artificial intelligence where you, know, you can ask a text-based question and, and do it at scale mm-hmm. and, you know, and then actually get quantitative outcomes from it. You, know, you can analyze all of that language and actually say, hey, this is what people in the why question, this is what they're most often saying and, and so we know, can, have that we scale. Can look at, we can interpret what, what the text says And using Mm. text analytics, we can, for example, figure out what percent of customers raised a particular topic. And of those, how many are with positive or negative sentiment? How does that relate Mm. when they raise the issue? How does that relate to their likelihood to recommend? And how much does positive or negative mention actually influence relative to other things that are mentioned, the overall likelihood to recommend? And, and importantly, it, now that we have not only text analytics, but we also have really good customer transaction data and we can link it, mm. we can f- even go further and say, I don't, I'm not just as interested, I'm not just interested in how the answer to the why question, like different, different topics raised in that influence NPS, I'm interested in what NPS was predicting, repeat purchase price realization, average order of value, like the, the drivers of economic yeah. growth. And we can do that really yeah. well. And then we can go even further and we can say, well, we only get feedback when we ask for it. We only get feedback from, you know, five, 10, in, in really good cases, like B2B cases, sometimes 60%. That's amazing. But we can do, 
we can build models that would actually, based on a pattern of a customer's interactions, transactions, what their flow through the system was, we can actually predict what they would have said if we had asked them for feedback and they had responded. We can, we can predict how likely they are to recommend. We can predict how likely they are to repurchase. And in many cases, when we, for example, we do analytics on the interaction, like a phone call with a service agent, we can mm -hmm. say why they feel that way and what the rep could do differently going forward to come to a slightly better outcome. It's really, really fascinating. I, I have to ask you this. So... Yeah, you sort of end up being responsible for one of the most ubiquitous questions, certainly in business, possibly in the English language. <laughs> so this, would you recommend insert insert X? How, how do you feel you know, when you receive a, an NPS survey yourself? Well, it, uh, so it depends. Um, a lot of times I feel frustrated because the company asking me for the feedback has asked at the wrong time or in the wrong way. Um, an example I had just this past weekend, I was trying to do something online and a big tech company that we all generally interact with, um, in, in interrupted the interaction I was doing digitally and with a big screen pop asking me to give them feedback on that particular mm. interaction. I was like, first of all, you just interrupted me in the middle of my work. Second, you're asking me about something there's no conceivable way I could have an informed opinion about because I'm not done yet. And the worst part is that that interaction requires two different steps. They did the mm. same darn thing in the second step. And I'm like, okay, this is... This is <laughs> my worst nightmare. I feel horrible that I have unleashed this thing on the world because <laughs> people are abusing their customers. And the whole point of reducing it, well, one of the most important points of reducing it down to a single question was to unburden customers from giving mm. you feedback on things that they don't have a lot of point of view on. It's like, you know, the, the old, the old survey you would get from your hotel that had 800 items that you could rate and you had only really dealt with one or two of them. And by the way, the one thing that mattered in your stay, which was, you know, I, I, this happened to me in a hotel, the, um, the air conditioning system makes a lot of noise and wakes me up in the middle of the night. That's not on that multiple choice mm -hmm. survey. Right. Yeah. So we tried to, to, to fix that. And now people are just asking inappropriate times, inappropriate questions in yeah. inappropriate ways. And that bugs me. I think it's, I think it's oftentimes one of the abuses I find of it, not wanting to get riff on this too much, but it's that thing of, um, you know, someone that's very dependent on online reviews and they kind of ask it as their gatekeeper question. So like, you know, and if you kind of, you know, put as a recommender a nine or 10, they'll then sort of go, oh, could you please review us, you know, on, on Google reviews or Yelp or something and send you that direction. And so it's like, and, and that bit you mentioned of it being in the flow, the thing which I can't stand is when I'm actually enjoying something and I'm, I'm you know, maybe it's even just a, it's just a, a game on my phone and I'm, I'm into it and I'm kind of, you know, I'm in the moment and then it just, yeah, takes me away from my experience of a cust being a customer to now rating my experience of being a customer. Well, it's, it's, no, it's, unusual it's, a, it's, a, it's a mistake, right? Like the, the thing, the thing is the net promoter system is founded on three basic principles. And the first one is what I like to call the prime directive. And if you ever watched Star Trek in the, the old Star Trek from the sixties, you would know that the prime directive is like the one rule you can't break. It, it comes above everything else. And that is, Everything you do, every time you interact with a customer should enhance the relationship between the customer and the company. Now, mm -hmm. asking a customer to give you feedback on things they don't care about at a moment that's inconvenient for them does not enhance the relationship. It undermines the relationship. You're breaking the first rule of the net promoter system. And, and that's not okay. 
the, the, the way that you ask for feedback should be part of the relationship. Right? I'm not going to ask you right now in the middle of this interview, hey, Mike, would you recommend me as a podcast guest to other people? Like, <laughs> how, is, how is this podcast going? <laughs> I mean, I, I, might, I might ask you how things are going. Like if you want to, you know, me to redirect or be less talkative, like that's fine. That's helping you. That's not about me. But, it, mm -hmm. but if I say, could, would you recommend me to somebody else at this moment? You don't know. And frankly, that's about me, not you. I'm eating into mm. my relationship equity by doing that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, um, it sounds like a kind of beginner's mistake, doesn't it? But it's, it's pretty, it's pretty common. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, I wish that it was, I, I find myself slightly surprised by the fundamental, what I think of as sort of obvious things that somehow are counterintuitive to lots of executives. Well, we just need to, we need to know more. Mm -hmm. We need to ask them more questions. I, I want to know, uh, you know, that button there, if, you know, does, is that button work for them? Give me a, let, let's interrupt them in the middle of their interaction and get them to tell us whether the button is in a convenient place. Like, <laughs> so you make it inconvenient mm -hmm. for them to do the transaction by asking them if it's convenient. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. The, the inappropriate requests for feedback that are come at, at inopportune times that are really about yeah yeah they're about they're about the company not the customer that, that's mm -hmm. the that's my point is that the, the 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 great thing that has come from net promoter is that um companies care about getting feedback from and learning from their customers the bad thing about net promoter was that somehow it got misinterpreted to be we need customers to tell us everything all the time about every topic. And um, that's you, not, that, that's about you, not me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, I mentioned, I mentioned at the top of, top of the show that you've done work that's included you know, leading many of the world's dramatic customer experience transformations. Yeah, what's, what's your favorite story from the road, so to speak? Um, I guess there are a couple of things that I, there are a couple of, well, I mean, it, it, I could interpret your question in a bunch of different ways. One would be, what are you proudest of? One would be, what was the most interesting thing that you did? One would be, um, what was the most difficult? Well, why did you, why did you have a go at all three? <laughs> oh man, I did, should have just <laughs> given you one. Um, I think I'm most proud of, uh, uh, my longest running client which was almost 20 years. Um, and that sounds crazy that you would work on something for 20 years, but it was a very large financial services company. And when we first got involved, um, they were coming off of uh, several years of reasonable success in a product-driven and functional orientation. Mm -hmm. And then it exploded. It just came apart. And the strategy that, you know, I can, I can say with some pride, one of our competitors led them down, um, which had been successful for, for a time, came home to roost. And they mm -hmm. were losing a million customers a year. They were churning. Wow. Um, they had written down their, their book value of their assets twice. One was a $750 million write-off. The other was a $500 million write-off. These were big numbers back in 30 years ago for these kind of, they're big numbers today, but they were really big for this company. Um, and they were in a little bit of crisis. You know, they, they had rebellions from bunch, from, from diff, many different constituents in their organization. And so they asked us to help them figure out um, what was driving the customer attrition issue. And they hypothesized that it had to do with like sending people too much direct mail and bugging them too often. And maybe they weren't doing a good job in answering the phones. And it turns out that wasn't it. I mean, yes, those were, those were bad things too. But the real issue was that the fundamental value proposition that had been successful 10 years earlier 
was out of date and their competitors mm. were just eating their lunch. And so it was a multi-year approach of first getting them to see, to look in the mirror and really understand the, how fundamental the issues and challenges were. And then change some of the fundamental beliefs they had about how you make money in that business and how you earn customer loyalty. And then change the operating model and the way that they do business to reinforce that and make it repeatable. And it was mm -hmm. actually this company that we're being asked to do the same project over again, several years apart, was kind of that eye-opening, oh my goodness, we have to do something different kind of thing. They were happy with the work. It just, we were looking at it saying, wait a minute, this doesn't work. This is not a good situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, what are some of the results that we, that we achieved? Well, one was um, the share price, which had, th their market value had declined by one half in the five years prior to our engagement. And over that 20 year period, they were one of the best performing stocks in, in financial services. I mean, it's um, the, it's the core of the, um, of the idea actually, isn't it? That like ultimately enterprise value or shareholder value is tied in a very, very long-term fashion to customer loyalty. Let me, let, I, I wrote a whole Harvard Business Review article about this because <laughs> I, because I, 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 I'm shocked that people don't understand this. Every dollar of revenue and profit in your company, by and large, starts in the pocket of a customer. And yeah. every dollar of value, therefore, in the business, with some exceptions, there's some asset value and stuff like that, is, a, is at least a function of the loyalty, the, well, the quality of the new customers you acquire and your ability to hold on to them and get them to buy more. That is mm. it. That's what a business is. It's, it's creating enough value for customers that they want to do business with you and that they want to continue to do business with you and even bring you more things to, to add value on. So yeah, I've, I've got it. I've got, oh, sorry, you go. No, 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 no. All I was yeah. going to say is, is, is that um, this is borne out analytically. So if you look at the companies that were multi-year leaders on NPS, customer satisfaction, you know, you name the metric, 10 years ago, so three, they led three or more, led their industry three or more years. And then you look at their, total shareholder returns over the subsequent 10 years, they outperform their industries by two to five times. They outperform the Vanguard total market index by three plus times. And they absolutely crush it on employee loyalty. So mm -hmm. it's like, it, it, this isn't... It, and, and if you compare them to like the good to great companies, like look at the companies that were listed in good to great and how they performed in the subsequent several years versus the companies we listed in the ultimate question 2.0 and how they performed in the, the subsequent 10 years. It's, yeah, that's, that's and, fascinating. And, and don't, do it, don't do it in absolute terms because the market conditions were different. Do it relative to the total market index and you'll mm. still see Companies that get their customers to stay longer, buy more, and tell their friends, those companies outperform the market. You mentioned in there um, employee loyalty, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one for me. I've always been trying to understand this link between, I guess, employee engagement and, and customer experience. And I, and I know it's a topic that's close to your heart as well. Um, what, what's... What's your riff on, on those, two, those two metrics? So the, the thing that people love to say is that you can't have loyal customers if you don't have loyal employees. Turns out that's not entirely true, but it is sort of true over long periods of time. It, it's also, I think, dangerous because... I can, have com I can have employees who are loyal for the wrong reasons, who do a terrible mm. job with customers. And so what we at Bain have, have done over the last 
15 or so years is we focused a lot of our energy on thinking about what about employee engagement, like what type of employee engagement more often leads to really high customer loyalty. And what about working in a company that has really high customer loyalty makes it more likely that you'll have really engaged employees? How do they interact? Mm. What we find is that I can have I can have really highly loyal employees, people who stay forever because they like the benefits, because they feel like they're treated well, because they enjoy each other's company, but not because they're serving customers with excellence. Mm. I can also have comp- I, I can have employees who are very proud of what they're doing for customers and very proud of the groundbreaking work they're doing, but who work for tyrants and who eventually burn out and leave. Mm. And, you know, I think there are lots of stories of um, very famous companies that are led by people who are really hard to work for and who for some reasonably long period of time um, succeed because of the excellence that they achieve and then kind of fall off a cliff because employees just can't take it anymore. Like they start to lose talent after, after a time. So there's this wackiness, there's like lots of externalities and the relationship is not as perfect as we might want it to be. Yeah. I think there's also a confusion between kind of a classic confusion between causation and correlation in this one too, isn't there? I mean, I, I remember when I worked for, for HP, uh, for Hewlett Packard back, back in the day and you know, at the beginning of my tenure, um, the company was just succeeding beyond anyone's dreams and everything was great. And because of that, benefits were great and you, know, you, you kind of had job for life and employees felt engaged. And then as the market started to change, because fundamentally the market changed because the internet came along and, and HP didn't adapt fast enough. That's really what happened. Um, you know, now, of course, there's some employee input into the fact that we didn't innovate, but you know, it's, it's, it's more of a kind of management leadership directional thing. And, um, and then the company started to do poorly and so it started to lay off people and, and uh, you know, et cetera, and engagement fell and benefits got pulled back. And so there's definitely a correlation, you know, but the causation, the direction of the causation in that particular example always felt to me like the company's performance suffered and therefore engagement went down rather than the reverse. So I, I, I think that the enduring model for employee engagement is really built on, on I, I think of it as like two basic layers, right? There's, this, there's the threshold stuff. Um, I work, I, you know, my workplace, I have what I need in order to to, to do a good job. I have support from the people that I work with. Uh, I feel like I'm treated fairly and compensated fairly, you know, like that's, that's kind of the threshold stuff. And then what, what puts people over the top, what makes them actually emotionally loyal, what makes them feel proud of where they work and able to, you know, that has to do with serving a higher purpose you know, mm. feeling like I, I'm contributing to making customers' lives better or the world a better place. And I know how my contribution plays in that, how I personally contribute to that. They, it also comes from feeling like you're part of a team that of people you mm. like and you trust and that you're proud to call yourself a part of. It comes from being in a place where there's opportunity to learn and grow into the future and become more effective at making the world a better place in the future, right? Mm. Those, those are good sources of employee engagement. Those are things that get people to walk over hot coals a little bit, not indefinitely, because at some point you burn out, right? Mm -hmm. But, but for sure, you know, look, Bain and Company is a great example. We are, we are the number one company in the U S on Glassdoor. We're the number one company, or at least we've been in the top four for as long as the, um, 
the glass door ratings have been been around, right? Mm-hmm. Vault, all these things. Why are we such a great place to to work? In part because we have a very principled set of values and goals that we aim towards. We we believe that we create real value for our clients, and that in as a result of that, we earn their loyalty and we ourselves achieve something. We also believe that it's important to like and trust each other. And we spend time on that. We have a saying that, that is really, it's not a, it's not a wishful thinking thing. It's, it's a descriptive saying. It is a Baney never lets another Baney fail. The implication being we help each other succeed. We don't have sharp elbows. Now I, I, I say that about Bain, it's just to illustrate that the that broader point is right, that it's it's mission driven, trust based, fairness, and growth opportunities. Like those are the kinds of things that that are the right sources of employee engagement and loyalty. Hey, so you're um you're an advisor for Joyous, like full full disclosure. <laughs> um yeah, yeah. You know, um I and I guess that you know, for for people who don't recall this, Joyous you know, powers companies to involve the front line in, in operational improvement. Typically, how do you how do you feel that piece of involving the front line plays into plays into employee experience? Well, I think I think one of the reasons that I'm that I was interested in Joyous and that I was willing to to be an advisor is that I believe deeply in the power of frontline employees, and I should say all employees, to make a difference if you're clear about what the goals and mission are, you give them the benefit of regular feedback about how they're able to contribute, and you give them a real Mm -hmm. voice in shaping their own work environment and shaping how they create value for customers. And, And I feel like Joyous is a great tool for facilitating that. It's one of many things that a company that the company's leadership can do to create that kind of environment. And, and it's a very effective way from what I've seen to give lots of employees a meaningful voice on things they know about that impact not just their own work, but the ability of the company to deliver for customers. That's, that's gold. Mm, so I'm, I'm just reflecting on the, your financial services story from sort of 20 to 30 years ago. You know, there's this belief, you know, very much part of our purpose and joyous, which is that the uh, you know, employees and particularly the front line, the folk that deal with customers every day, um, know more about not just the customers, but about the competition and the market and what's changing than anyone else in your organization. They certainly know more than, than the executive. And so in that scenario where where the world is changing, and um, you know, and the offerings from competitors are becoming rapidly different. Um, yeah, you know, the, the the first place that's going to be felt is in the front line. I agree with that. I I think that there is um, every single person in an organization has a particular keyhole through which they view the world. Right. So frontline employees who are out serving customers. So think of the service techs who are installing things in people's homes or fixing things, um, telephone service representatives, salespeople, even there's a digital front line, right? Like the people who are designing websites. Mm. These people have one angle on what's going on and they're very close to that particular thing. So those service techs, they know what it's like for customers in their homes to have, let's say we're talking about internet service, to have an internet outage or to have really terrible experience setting up their Wi-Fi or, you know, blah, blah, blah. They also may have lots of interactions with customers that give them insight into how the customers think about competitors and what mm. is, you know, oh, my neighbor had this problem with the air competitor and they got it solved in two days. That kind of thing is really, really valuable, and it's it's not necessarily easily available to people at headquarters. Mm. Having said that, it doesn't necessarily tell the whole picture. Right? 
I, they're, they're interacting with a certain type of customer uh, over a certain subset of issues mm. in a certain context. And so they're really good. Employees are really good at identifying ways that their work could be done better and at ways, ways that they could better serve their colleagues or their customers. Uh, what, they're not so good necessarily at, at identifying competitive s- strategy, uh, you know, opportunities. Mm. So you go back to your HP example. I don't know if, if listening to frontline employees would have really resulted in the right mix of investments to prepare for the onslaught of the internet on the business. Mm. It, Probably not, right? Like there, there were a whole host of issues that were, that, that were underneath that, not just not listening to employees. Yeah, a very, very interesting. Hey, um, to kind of close this out, I just have one last question. Um, so, yeah, you've been in the world of, I guess, customer experience and, and customer loyalty for more than 30 years, right? Where does, where does it head? Yeah, what does it look like? 10, 20, 30 years in the future from here? Well, I, I don't know where it will be 30 years in the future from here. And um, if I told you that I did, it would be a good reason to just discount everything else I told you. <laughs> um, do I believe, so, so what, are, what, are, what are some things that I, I can say with some confidence? One is that the mundane work of the routine is going to continue to be taken by digital channels, by AI, by, um, you know, we'll get better and better at making customers' lives easier through automated approaches to self-service and to even, you know, self-healing products. Mm. I think that's amazing. Like we're, it's, our lives are going to, as customers are going to get better because technology will continue to offer ways to make everything a little easier and a little faster. I also really deeply believe that there is always going to be a role for human interaction. We are blood and blood we are flesh and blood beings. We need human interaction on a regular basis. We need empathy. We need creativity. So while I think that many, many, many of our customer experiences are going to be facilitated by technology and improved and sped up, I think the companies that win ultimately are still going to be human in some important ways. And they're going to be really good at understanding which things require human contact and which ones don't. Mm. Yeah, so so the value of human contact in in a world where you know artificial intelligence and other mechanization and so on removes the requirement for human interaction more and more the human interaction itself becomes more and more valuable that's that's what you're saying isn't it Yeah it is and and we had you know over the last few years we've had this wonderful natural experiment caused by a pandemic right we were isolated for some extended period of time. We did not go into our offices. We did not interact with our colleagues in the flesh. And there are certain great things that came out of that that are you know, freeing, allowing us to work more virtually. But we also learned that we lost something important in that in, there are things you can do in a room with somebody. There are the the uh, serendipitous and spontaneous interactions that you have with people or the observations you make from a human face-to-face interaction that are just not easy to replicate in a digital world. Maybe, maybe we'll find that we can simulate a lot of those things in the future. I don't know. I think mm-hmm. we're just, we're still flesh and blood. It's still important. On, on, on that note, I think that's a good place to finish. Yeah, Rob, thank you so much for your time. It's been, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thanks for coming on the show. Anytime, Mike. You know I love, I love talking to you. This has been the Joyous Podcast, brought to you by Joyous, human conversations and AI analytics in one. 
Find out more at joyoushq.com. If you liked this show, make sure to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of the Joyous Podcast was hosted by Mike Carden and produced by Kai Crow. Thanks for joining us. And remember, everyone deserves to be joyous. Joyous.